let me introduce our two distinguished speakers. So first is Martin Fisher, who is the Kumagai Professor at Stanford School of Engineering and a senior fellow at the Precourt Institute for Energy. Professor Fisher's research goals are to improve the productivity of project teams involved in designing, building, and operating facilities and to enhance the sustainability of the built environment. I'm sure many of you are already familiar with his work. Uh, it develops the theoretical foundations and applications for virtual design and construction. And he's also quite the educator on VDC, and I think uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. But uh, he's developed several workshops and courses that, that instruct people on VDC. Joining him is Danielle de Buncho, the co-founder and CEO of Via Technic, a virtual design and construction consulting and implementation firm transforming the real estate and construction industry by spearheading the advancement of building information modeling, BDC, virtual reality, augmented reality, and artificial intelligence. She was awarded Building Design and Construction's 40 Under 40 in 2018 and ENR Top Young Professional in the National. It's our honor to have both of them here today to talk about VDC and a little bit more uh, about virtual design and construction, and how it can help you uh, take your projects to the next level um, in terms of efficiency. So with that, I'm going to hand the presentation over to both of them. Uh, Martin? Yeah, good morning. Uh, thank you, Pax. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening from my home here in Menlo Park. Uh, I'm Martin Fischer. Uh, from Stanford, and together with my co-presenter, Daniel Di Buncho, I'm very happy to welcome you to this introduction to VDC, Virtual Design and Construction. We'll explain why professionals, projects, and companies use VDC as the project management approach or framework, and what VDC is, and we will showcase how projects have benefited from the application of VDC. Before we jump into these topics, we'll say a few more words about ourselves so that you know where we are coming from. So um, I grew up in Switzerland, as you may detect by my accent. And you see here the house I grew up in. And in the left picture, my father, working with a coworker, my father is the one in the, in the right. Uh, I grew up on our own construction. And as we were building our house, like every other client, we had more wishes than we had budget. And so we children had to help. My sister and I had to help uh, build the house on the weekends. So I was... Uh, uh, one Sunday, Saturday, uh, working on the top floor, my father gave me a task. I finished it and then said, hey, Dad, I'm done. Come take a look. And he looked at it and said, OK, yeah, you did an OK job. But, you know, you would have done a better job if you had used the particular tool. I said, I know. And then he said, well, why, why did you not use the tool? Um, well, the tool was in the basement. And, you know, I would have had to go get it and come back up two floors. That was a little much for an 11-year-old boy uh, to do, so I just muddled through. Uh, so to that, this is what I heard from my father. He said, you are an idiot if you're not using the best tool possible. And this has really stuck with me, so I wanted to share this little story. Uh, so now you know where I'm coming from, uh, where I grew up in that sense, but also where I'm coming from in my mind, because I'm always looking at the work we do as engineers, managers, designers, architects, and so on as AC professionals, and think about, are we really using the best tools? Because when we have better tools, we can achieve better things. And uh, I'll let uh, Danielle say a few more words about herself. Thanks, Martin. Uh, really love that story. Um, so a little bit about myself. I, I grew up in the construction industry. Uh, my parents started a infrastructure construction company when I was about three years old. So it's an industry that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, but I couldn't help but feeling um, that as time went on, so much technology was hitting the world and our lives were changing. But a lot of construction was staying stagnant. Um, so about eight years ago, I founded a company called Via Technic. Um, which focuses on bringing uh, that sort of technology, you know, VDC and, and related tools um, to the industry. We work with companies in three different ways. Um, one is in an advisory capacity, so really understanding okay, what's your corporate strategy and how does a digital strategy align to that. Um, also through development and implementation, so actually implementing VDC um, and then through education. So I'm very excited to be here today. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us and bringing uh, this uh, sense of reality. Uh, um, okay, so why um, 
to oh. professionals around the world use VDC. It's really they want to create high performing buildings more often, bring new technologies into their practice in a systematic way and consistent way and achieve their corporate aspirations and also avoid rework. Um, so very quickly illustrate those. Um, we see remarkable projects around the world um, for many different reasons, depends on the, the aspirations of the client. Um, for example, the Tesla Gigafactory was built, designed and built incredibly fast and actually offers a lot of flexibility in its layout. Um, the, the Bullet Center in, uh, in Seattle, um, amazing environmental performance, those being water positive, energy positive, uh, building on the lower right uh, became uh, was very fast, uh, affordable, but also became uh, because of that uh, and sustainable beca because of that became the highest money making real estate deal uh, in Arizona um, or in, in Switzerland, um, the longest tunnel, railway tunnel ever built. So there's many criteria that uh, we can apply to define what is high performance. And we see some very high performing buildings, but we also know that uh, too often we have uh, buildings that don't perform quite as highly as they should. And uh, what we found with BDC, you have a better chance of creating a high performing building. Um, we are bombarded every day with new technologies around mobile, cloud, um, dimensional control, machine learning, AI, Internet of Things, 3D printing, um, virtual reality, and so on. Uh, um, many technologies, everyone by themselves, already a big deal, but and in fact, they're all happening right now. And um, what you've seen is that you can bring these um, technologies into your practice in a much more focused, strategic way when you um, work with a framework like VDC. Um, I was browsing across a number of websites of companies around the world, and uh, basically these are the kinds of statements you read. And I looked for sort of the first opening statement that presents the company, you know, work with all the parties involved, achieve common goals, rethink design and construction, improve performance, uh, focus on the success of clients, and so on. I'm sure you've seen uh, these uh, aspirations as well, which are, of course, fantastic. Um, but Again, how are we going to make sure that every project achieves these kinds of aspirations? And, and uh, again, we have found that uh, BDC is really a way uh, to do so. And finally, we see still um, too many problems on site that should not happen, uh, that require rework, that uh, waste resources, uh, like this example here, uh, again, from my home country. Obviously, something has to give. Uh, you cannot put the duck through that hole while the electrical toy is in front of it. So these are really the, the reasons we've seen why companies are moving towards VDC. So let me introduce VDC in a nutshell so you have an idea of what it is. In my mind, it's really how you would logically manage projects in 2020. But of course, it's not always that easy to do the thing that's logic. Um, so, uh, but let me explain what VDC is. So of course, to have a great project, you would bring the right people together, together at the same time so that you have the knowledge available you need for the input in the project for the decision making so that those decisions stick uh, you have you move uh, forward in a in a concerted way and don't have to come back because some ideas show up too late so you bring the right people together but of course in 2020 there's only so much we can do without digital tools so you give them the best tools possible because you have a great team so you should equip the team with great tools and in particular tools that are uh, really important is one that focuses on what the client our clients are buying um, and if you are working for an owner that also means the clients the users of the building for example so uh, well they are buying a building a road a tunnel a physical structure from us so we need a tool that puts what we um, design build operate into the computer and digital form. So we can uh, share the information about it, we can see it, uh, we all see the same thing. So a tool like BIM is particularly important given the value that we create for our clients. Um, okay, but the best people, the best tools together don't achieve much if you don't put them in a good workflow. So if you don't align, for example, the delivery of design, the architects and construction um, then um, the project will not be successful. So here you see from a hospital project in uh, San Francisco, um, the, left, um, the left diamond shows how far the architects thought they're going to take the design. The right triangle uh, or diamond shows how where the builders thought they would pick it up. 
obviously there was a gap. They were both working with BIM, but there was a gap. And so they figured that out early enough and uh, co-created a workflow that allowed them to be successful and not point fingers at each other. And uh, so about the best people, the best tools, the best workflows will not achieve anything uh, meaningful if you're not focused on the right things. So we have to establish and track client and project objectives. So this, this is VDC, right? Bringing people together, uh, we call it integrated concurrent engineering. Very, very key that we bring the people together concurrently um, and, and solve problems together. We give them tools like building information models. We put them in the right uh, management approach, project production management, we call it. I focus on the production of the project. And uh, together with these methods of managing people, technology, and process, we achieve what we found greater project and client objectives. But they are defined in quantifiable, measurable ways. So this is VDC as a whole um, and VDC in a nutshell. We'll illustrate the application um, as we go forward. Um, uh, we show this typically as a framework like this, where you have uh, the client objectives that give rise to the project objectives. Um, then that allow you to figure out who are the people we need to have on the project, what tools do they need, and what's the right workflow process uh, so that they can achieve those objectives. So you can think of EDC in this way, who should work together, what tools should they use? <clears throat> Sorry, here. Yeah. How should they work and what should they achieve? Or you can approach it in, in this way, you could say, why does the project exist? What, what does the client really need this uh, building structure for? What does the project team therefore need to achieve? So the project objectives. And how is the project team going to achieve these results? This uh, are the VDC capabilities um, that um, need to be brought into an organization. You can read quite many uh, case studies of the application of VDC in a book I had the pleasure of co-authoring with three practitioners um, called Integrating Project Delivery. In the book, uh, we build on many successful examples uh, from around the world. And um, we create the high-performing building as the focus of uh, what we need to achieve. And uh, for that, we need to define it. We call that measurable value. You saw examples of that definition at the beginning of the slide deck. Um, and the key role, of course, is um, to envision early on in the project the performance you could have with different kinds of designs. For that, we need an integrated set of information about the project that supports visualization, simulations, analysis, optimizations, um, so that we can uh, see what is really um, achievable. And we need to, of course, orchestrate the people, the organization, and the processes so that we create a building that is indeed high performing. Typically that building or that structure, I mean, I say building, I really mean it very broadly. Um, any, anything that we built in, uh, in the world. Um, typically what we found that a high performing building has um, integrated systems. We, we have technical systems that are necessary for the building that really support each other, work synergistically. But those don't just happen by themselves. For that, we really, we need to bring the organization, the process, and the information together in an integrated and concert, concentrated way. Um, so this allows us to connect the three very common acronyms, IPD, VDC, BIM, that we see across the industry. Um, because we have basically a strategy of integration to create high-performing buildings. Um, supported by a tool like BIM. And if you looked over the uh, top, right, uh, the methods that are used to execute this uh, strategy, we see actually VDC. We see um, the tools that are used, we see the collaboration, uh, we call it I sessions, we see production management, and we see the objectives. So these are the VDC capabilities, and um, then we also have alignment capabilities um, that are also critical. So I wanted to very quickly uh, position VDC um, also in the context of other uh, common acronyms. So VDC is not BIM, it's not IPD. VDC is the method to execute the IPD strategy, integrated uh, uh, project delivery strategy. And BIM is a critical part of VDC, but it's not the same as VDC. So very, very quickly, I want to take you through a personal journey. So uh, of how did I arrive um, 
to be passionate about VDC. Um, here's one of the first projects I worked on, the James Lamar Rosano Bridge in Rhode Island. We had to redesign it so it was buildable. And um, I had two reflections. One is why did the designer and the builder not work together from the beginning uh, for such a complex project? And why was it such a struggle every day to find the right information? This really got me uh, to researching uh, BIM. And um, then I was sort of in a way validated. I felt validated with that uh, direction when I read about the Barcelona um, project uh, from Frank Gehry, the Golden Fish, Best Dorado, where um, in 1992, because of the time pressures of having the sculpture ready for the Olympics, the structure was built directly from the BIM. There was an architect on site with a computer with 3D model uh, directly feeding the information to the workers so that they could install it rapidly. So I thought, okay, this is the kind of vision I also believe in in construction. Um, tools uh, started to mature. We were able to do our first 3D and 4D model for the renovation of a hospital right here in San Mateo in 1993. And uh, we saw the value of uh, uh, BIM to bring um, diverse project team together and focus it on important issues. Um, over time, people realized they would be more effective when they work together side by side from different disciplines. Here you see the first big room uh, used by uh, uh, DPR construction and the subcontractors on a medical office building um, here in Mountain View. Uh, that was in the, around 2003, 2004. Um, and on that project, they really um, brought many aspects of, of VDC together because they also rethought the process to leverage the collaboration of the team and to leverage the, uh, the tools um, for project success. And the key thing here is in the typical sequential flow of work is this double-headed error where the design team and the building team together uh, created a buildable, functional, operable, uh, usable design uh, that required iteration around the value the client was seeking. And for that, BIM and the supervised process and the collaboration were absolutely critical. So the result of that project was that it was built 9% uh, cheaper and 6% six months faster than comparable buildings. There were many of these types of projects going on around us here. So we started to see in the uh, early 2000s the value of bringing all of the VDC elements together. Um, you see again the VDC framework here illustrated with these uh, experiences over time. Um, so. Let us now hopefully have a sense of now why uh, companies and professionals use VDC and what VDC is. But let us further illustrate that with a few case studies from around the world. So as we were defining VDC um, at uh, our research center, SIFI at Stanford, we um, saw that one of our collaborators, um, SPS Strategic Partial Solutions, was working with the British Airport Authority uh, on the extension of the Heathrow Express um, to Terminal 5. And that really is, to my knowledge, the first documented example of the application of VDC. Um, we didn't call it VDC at the time, but I think it's still a, a good case study to show where VDC came from and, uh, and, and to show how all the elements work together. <clears throat> on that project, um, which was quite a massive infrastructure project, they had a key challenge that they only had three days um, of lay down uh, space available for materials on site. But they had a rebar um, detailing and fabrication process that had a variability of plus minus two weeks over six weeks. So it could take four weeks, it could take eight weeks. So you can see the disconnect here. You have four week variability, but you only have space for three days worth of material. And they said, this is not gonna work. This is gonna create a disaster. Um, we, we, we may not finish the project on time. This was the largest concrete project in Europe at the time. So this was a big deal. So they said, okay, we have to fix it. Um, so how did they approach it? They said, well, we have to re-engineer the rebar production process, okay? Good. That's, uh, that's good, that's a, that's a nice idea. What does this actually mean? This means that we have to be able to reduce um, the lead time from six weeks to one week, because that's where the site can much more reliably signal what rebar is needed. We need to basically cut out the variability and we need to reduce the cycle time for installation so it becomes more predictable uh, from two weeks to two days. 
So uh, here you see key uh, parts of how we think about VDC and how we bring VDC onto projects. You see a focus on the actions, decisions, we call them controllable factors that you can take on your projects. And the objective with, metro, with quantified targets that you want to achieve to make this action meaningful and to connect it to what you want to do. Because you can see how if you meet these objectives, you have a better chance of finishing the project on time. <clears throat> which was, of course, imperative. And um, so another strategy they had, design the rebar for pre-assembly. <clears throat> the specific target was that they wanted to have 75% of rebar pre-assembled, which 15, 17, 18 years ago was really quite aggressive, right? That they wanted to use pool planning for rebar detailing and fabrication so that they would have just-in-time delivery and not exceed the three-day laydown space, and that they wanted to collaboratively detail the rebar in weekly digital build sessions so that they could all agree, um, yes, this is buildable a rebar. So to illustrate that, here, uh, the before and after look at the process, the process for engineering, absolutely critical part, right? The attention to process, project production management. Um, then the design for pre-assembly, a fully detailed uh, rebar in BIM, now very common at the time, uh, much less common. First time I saw this on a project used at wide scale. And then the pool process so that the site could signal to the engineers, okay, we need this rebar next week. Now make it, um, detail it and make it over the course of the week. And uh, here, uh, maybe the, the centerpiece of the whole strategy, this uh, weekly digital build session where basically everybody that has a say in, yes, this is the right way bar, the cost estimator, the project manager, uh, site, fab site foreman, fabricator, and so on, structural engineer, were together in a room and said, yes, this works, we are signing off. You can see how much time you can cut out of a project schedule, um, how much back and forth you can cut out if you can bring the people together with good tools in, in the right process. So put that back into the VDC framework, we saw here how the combination of um, defining the challenge, the objective, and then uh, in measurable ways led to um, the targeted re-engineering of the process, which was only then, the execution was only possible by having these weekly digital build sessions that were supported by uh, a very detailed BIM. And uh, if you take one of those pieces out, you don't have as successful a project. Um, and that's what we have really seen time and again. And that's really something that is critical when you use VDC, is to not stop at just using BIM or not stop at just using uh, Lean with maybe a little bit of BIM or not just stopping at collaboration, to really bring all of these um, work methods together and to be uh, very deliberate deliberate about uh, what objectives you're trying to achieve. So I'll turn it over to uh, Danielle to share a couple of case studies from her experience. Perfect. Thanks, Martin. Martin. All right. All so right. I'm going to share my screen for you today. Um, I think there's a little bit of an echo. Maybe if somebody else can go on mute. Um, so I'm going to share three examples for you today. I chose these examples um, because VDC was used to address a very specific challenge or project goal. Um, and I'm hoping that by going through these three examples pretty quickly, you'll be able to imagine how VDC can be used on your project. So I'd like to start with a project um, where a large co-working office developer approached us with a specific goal of how they could build projects faster. It was sort of interesting how this project came about. We had run a VDC workflow with one of our general contractor clients on one of um, their co-working projects. This developer has very high liquidated damages if the project is late, but they also have a bonus if the project's finished early. Um, and so through that VDC workflow with the general contractor, we were able to help them achieve that bonus so the owner came to us and said, hey, if this project could have been built that fast, that should have been the project schedule from the beginning. How can you help us build all of our projects faster? So we said, we think we can do that through um, by utilizing 4D BIM in a well-run VDC framework. Um, and I think one important thing to note about this developer is that they only start leases on the first of a month. 
So a two day delay really turns into a one month delay, um, which means that there's both construction cost implications and then also a loss of revenue. Um, so what we did was we created a 4D BIM um, by utilizing the design BIM and then taking the original general contractor's construction schedule. Um, we we uh, used pull planning methodology to get information from the trade contractors um, to understand what, what are their productivities, um, what is their task sequencing, what durations do we need to assume. And then we ran through this with a very specific goal of cutting the schedule by 20%. What was sort of interesting here is we were able to achieve that. Um, but we did not change any durations and we didn't change any productivity rates, right? It would be very easy to say, hey, you know, wall framing is on the critical path. It's 10 days. Let's do that in five days and we'll save, you know, five days from your construction schedule. Um, we, we kept all the productivity durations as a given, but only thought about resequencing work. So we were able to say things like, hey, there's a lot of work happening in zone A, nothing's happening in zone, Z, zone C. Can we get a crew out there? Or we have lighting install following ductwork install with this much of a lag. Because we have the schedule in this very visual collaborative format, we can see that there's space to shorten that lag. So can we do that? Um, this is, uh, I tried to map this project using the VDC framework um, so that you can see really how it all came together. So as I said, there was this project objective of maximizing lease revenue. Could we get one extra month of revenue? and reducing schedule duration by 20%. But what's really important to note here is how that really rolls up into client objectives um, where you can then apply that schedule saving methodology from this project across the global portfolio. And I think this is an important point because it shows that we're able to close the feedback loop, right? What we've learned here with one VDC workflow on one project, we can scale across multiple projects and really take advantage of that learning. The 4D BIM was obviously that essential tool um, that was used for both visualization and schedule optimization. Um, but it was really by putting it together with uh, ICE sessions um, so that we could have real time decision making um, for how to resequence work um, and putting it together with that full planning methodology. So, so as Martin says, it was, it's really more than the BIM, it's how it comes together with both the people on the process side. The next example I'd like to share um, is for a wastewater treatment plant. It's a large scale project um, where the challenge here is specifically to eliminate rework during construction. It's been a problem on past projects. You can see just by the density and complexity and the scale of the building, um, this is a challenge. It's a challenge they faced before and it's a challenge that resulted in both cost schedule overruns or cost overruns and, and schedule delays. So we built a VDC workflow that specifically targeted two goals. First, eliminate clashes between systems virtually before they happen in the field. And second, enable prefabrication of certain systems so that work on site was reduced, right? And if work on site could be reduced, that rework um, could be eliminated. So when thinking through the BIM execution plan, the level of development of the BIM was aligned to these two goals. And so the majority of the, of the model was LOD 350. Um, but for certain strategic items um, that were going to be prefabricated, the LOD was 400. Um, and you know, architectural and structural elements, depending on the, the importance and the interface with those strategic MEPF systems, um, was either LOD 300 or 350. The entire team realized the importance of clash detection um, and issue management in achieving that rework reduction goal. So a very detailed approach, approach was used here. For every issue, six attributes were tracked, right? And so please note that not all issues were geometric clashes necessarily. Issues could be identified related to constructability, model fidelity, order of operations, right? That construction sequencing, for example. Um, and then these six attributes were analyzed by our team, um, as well as the general contractor's estimating team to determine the impact that they had on the project, right? Mainly the avoidance of man hours, labor costs, or material costs. Um, the status, the open date, the close date that I note here are actually incredibly interesting because it helps us from a process perspective and enables us to understand the real-time status of issues. 
This slide shows how that data was visualized. I realize it's probably quite hard to see, so I'll walk through it quickly. Um, but here in table one, issue type mix, you see that the majority of clashes are in a light blue color, which means they're trade coordination issues. As a uh, counter example, very little in yellow, which uncovers true design issues or errors. So we can see that, that these issues really can be solved through um, good construction phase VDC workflows. Table two helps us prioritize the issues. Um, you can see that about a quarter of the issues are high priority or critical. That's where we should focus our time to have the biggest impact on a project. Table three um, shows which trades are conflicting with each other. The largest amount of clashes are between two trades, process piping and electrical. So we could see there that we would benefit from ice session breakouts bet between those two trades, bringing the right people together at that right time to solve those problems. I'm going to go to the next slide here. Um, at the end of the day, the owner wanted to see, right, was all of this work working? Um, so we had to quantify the efforts. So we tried to quantify uh, cost or time reduction. So our team worked with the general contractor's estimators to take the class reports and calculate man hours saved and cost saved by resolving the issues early through VDC rather than encountering those issues in the field. So really justifying this VDC workflow for future projects. Here again, I've mapped what I just went through to the VDC framework. What I'd like you to focus on here um, in this particular example is that 100% of the ICE, BIM, and PPM activities were aligned to that very specific challenge I mentioned at the beginning, reducing rework in the field. Right, and that's the client's objectives to reduce rework, which led to project objectives of clash detection and prefabrication. To close, I'd like to talk about how VDC has been extended through the project life cycle. I think it's very easy to focus VDC just on the design and construction phase, um, but it is important to understand that this can have a life through facilities management and operations. Um, so here's a project we did at a university um, with, a, with a specific focus on building operations. Um, the challenge presented by the owner was that a facilities management BIM workflow could help reduce the project life cycle costs and streamline facilities management and operations processes. Here's a snapshot to give you a better idea of what was happening on the project. Um, so we had the project BIM that was created throughout the design and construction process which we then linked to customized asset data as well as um, O&M documents, um, operating and maintenance documents. So we worked with the owner to determine what five attributes are most important to the facilities management operations processes. Um, that became the asset ID uh, or asset tag, the equipment type, manufacturer and model number, as well as the room location. That, that locational data was quite important. And then each piece of information, each piece of equipment was then linked to the O&M manual. And this became a great tool for them, both from a visual perspective and from a data perspective. If you think through the software workflow, you see that we had a, a, a software that became really that central environment where the building could be visualized and where the data from those various sources was linked. On the right side of the slide, you see just that spreadsheet of data. And I think when you juxtapose um, this spreadsheet of data to what I showed before, you really start to see the value of putting everything in that central location and having a data and visual link. Um, it became an important tool to make this building information more accessible for any stakeholder involved in operations, facilities management, or engaged in future construction um, or renovation efforts. Um, my slide is not advancing. Can somebody help me advance to the next uh, framework slide? Uh, it looks like it doesn't like the video, Daniel. Okay. Well, that's oh, okay. there, it is. Um, there it is. All right, perfect, there we go. So um, I'd like to leave you with, with this visual of, of how we've extended this idea um, on other projects. So here you see a virtual walkthrough of a mechanical room um, where 
you know, now stakeholders from all around the world can get a glimpse into their project and be able to pull up important information about their project. Um, what we've noticed is that in light of the remote working situation forced by the COVID-19 pandemic, there's even more value out of these applications. And you can imagine how stakeholders from anywhere in the world, right, can now take a glimpse inside that building. Um, so I'd like to end with um, just recapping that BDC framework really quickly, if someone can help me get to that next slide. Well, there's too many, there's too many cooks. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I think we can we can transition to the next example, uh, Martin. If you'd like to to take it away. No, no. I mean uh, the re the recap slide is there. Oh, I actually can't see it. Um, so I think if we look at the recap slide here, again, what I'd like to note is how the VDC framework and the activities done during, um, through BIM, through ICE, and through PPM are all in done, with, done in line with those project and client objectives. Um, and really highlighting that from a project level, there's already value. But if you start to extend this value um, to the enterprise and being able to take these learnings across multiple projects, um, you're really able to make the most of it. So with that, I'll turn it right. back to you. Thanks, Martin. Sorry for the technical hiccup. <laughs> Thanks, Danielle, uh, for showing the application of EDC really across uh, many phases of, uh, of projects and uh, different types of projects. I want to just conclude with uh, very, very rapidly with a, a couple uh, more case examples. Um, to show you the, the global reach of VDC, because we've seen project teams really around the world take advantage of, of VDC here. Um, um, John Zacharias Lickness from Cruiser Smith uh, led to the uh, deployment of VDC for the delivery of a uh, university building in Western Norway. And uh, the client had uh, simply the request, we want the best teaching building in Western Norway. Nothing uh, more than that. Uh, that included uh, uh, dramatically reduced CO2 emissions, a BREAM excellent rating, net zero energy building, zero mistakes as handover, of course, on time, budget, um, all of those things that are quite typical in terms of client and project objectives. Um, the, here you see um, the workroom they had, the, where they had the ICE session, the collaboration sessions, um, where they really focused on uh, making sure everything was uh, as prefabricatable uh, as possible, um, that the construction was really coordinated with the design sequence. Um, all the technical systems were coordinated and that each meeting had very uh, clear agendas, objectives, desired outcomes, uh, so that the team was effective and, uh, and, and successful. Um, in terms of the application of BIM, they um, used it um, um, for looking again at prefabrication options, um, the uh, areas of uh, management on site, um, the coordination of the technical systems, uh, 40 models to share progress, connected with production quantities to, to, to have a reality check. Uh, they brought the temporary structures in and made sure that they didn't collide. And they um, positioned, um, tested all the crane locations in BIM. Then, uh, and then in terms of production management, uh, they really uh, connected, they, they brought basically uh, the daily planning, weekly planning into a digital environment. They developed software to do so. Um, and they connected that with BIM so that they could really execute day-to-day um, -day, um, the ambitious targets they had. Um, and so, um, so you can see again, uh, the combination of all the elements of EDC. They tracked how they're doing uh, regularly. Here you see how they tracked their collaboration sessions. You can see that uh, uh, they had a dip and then they, they fixed it. And then um, eventually they had a big dip and they said, oh, oops, this is no longer working. We thought we had it, um, but the data show we don't. And, and then they were able to have high sessions at a high level. This was done with very, very simple questions like, was this session good? Did you have a meaningful input? Uh, questions like that which we see uh, quite commonly done to, to, to create a rapid feedback loop for the team, how things are going. Um, so they were able to reduce the duration by three months. Um, they um, and, and uh, shorten a few other parts of the project as well. 
um, to contribute to the three months, and they uh, were able to take a million um, of contingency funding out of the project, which, of course, uh, the CFO was very happy with. Um, and you see it here represented um, all of these points in the BDC framework again. And you see, uh, once again, if you take one of those uh, elements out, uh, it's just not quite so successful. Um, and finally, uh, very rapidly, even though it deserves like a whole presentation on its own, uh, Raul Ezekire from uh, Kosapi led the deployment of VDC to deliver very successfully uh, the main facilities for the Pan Am Games in Lima. Um, designed and built 97,000 square meters of multi-sports facility in 18 months. I would think quite an achievement. This was, of course, highly scheduled, critical, uh, high quality had to be achieved. And uh, as you, if you followed the games last year, it was a very, very successful, uh, thanks in part of uh, this performance uh, from this team. Um, they, uh, again, brought um, the right people together in these uh, I sessions, integrated concurrent engineering sessions, uh, where they managed to solve 15 critical issues on average every two hour sessions. And they had, um, a few sessions each week um, for a long period. You, know, you can see five sessions uh, per week. And um, they typically included 10 team members so that right everybody was on the same page um, and solved the problems together. Um, in terms of BIM, they solved 4,000 issues before um, project went into construction so that the construction could run much more smoothly. And you see again the involvement of the different uh, participants to give you a data and a sense of um, the scale of it. And in terms of uh, managing the process, one of the key successes here was that they, um, in the early I sessions, created how the team was gonna work together uh, so that everybody uh, was again on the same page uh, with the procedures they're gonna follow and establish how they're gonna use the common data environment. Again, with a multidisciplinary team of 10, 10 key participants. Um, so here you see uh, a way of uh, one example of how they measured the progress of BIM and how it contributed to uh, resolving uh, clashes and, and uh, create a smooth construction. So uh, they found that um, um, it was important to get the client involved, um, to uh, define the common objectives, um, to, to really focus in the first I sessions on how to uh, work together on the project uh, that also they learned that those sessions take a lot of effort to plan if you want to have them run well, um, to use the cloud and to not only just map the process, but really use it in a continuous improvement cycle with the plan to study act approach. So we hope that with these examples, you've seen um, the, the breadth of use of EDC around the world and also in terms of types of projects and, and project phases. So to, to recap, um, VDC is really about the power of AND, um, meaning, you know, the definition of objectives, uh, KPIs, if you like that word, um, to be supported by uh, collaboration, integrated concurrent engineering, um, with building informational modeling and attention to process, uh, managing the production um, of the project. So VDC aligns the definition of measurable client and project objectives with the planning, design, engineering, and management methods, the people process technology, um, to achieve these objectives. So thank you for uh, tuning in, for listening to this introduction of VDC, and we hope we were able to um, demystify VDC, but also give you some inspiration in terms of how you can bring it to your projects. Thank you so much, Martin and Danielle. That was uh, that was wonderful, and I think that's a perfect segue. So you you've developed and you've worked with uh, professionals to develop into the the sort of a, a educational experience to get people up to speed on VDC, and you've also gone through a lot of really wonderful examples of successful implementations. When you're teaching this, or when you're talking with people who are trying to implement VDC, what do you see? What do you and Danielle see as the major uh, obstacles to successfully implementing VDC? You talked a lot about engaging with the owners, and there's a lot of extra time, sort of getting them to meet regularly to develop the VDC plans. Um, so maybe that's one obstacle. But in general, when you've seen an unsuccessful implementation, what's gone wrong? Um, yeah, I'm curious uh, to see what Danielle says. Um, I, I would say that that. The biggest challenge we've seen around the world is definition of measurable project and client objectives to, to really create a, a target for the project team to achieve. 
that for some reason has been quite challenging and of course we will uh, work through in the in the in the program how to do so and then how to how to use them the other um, i would say is that uh, well the other two is that the vdc elements are used in isolation there's too much there's focus on bim but not enough attention on process or collaboration or there's focus on working together but not quite enough use of the other elements and so on um so the the power of and is not realized. And the third one is that uh, people are working in isolation. So they're on their project, they're trying to do great things, but, you know, um, many things get in the way. And uh, what we've seen is by creating a community of practitioners that want to implement VDC on their projects, um, the learning gets accelerated very rapidly. The, the things that work get shared, the things that don't work get shared um, in, in a way that's very meaningful to the situation you face at the moment and uh, that community has proven to be very very um, helpful um, in getting you out of your uh, frustration and isolation that we typically often see on projects when you try to innovate i don't know if uh, danielle you want to yeah. uh, add something to these yeah i can add a little bit um and it's, I think it's complementary to what you brought up so i don't think there's one implementation challenge that we always see, right? Um, there's, it's usually a combination of a few things kind of coming together. Um, I do find that if the project team and the owner can set a strong vision that really lays the groundwork for success, when that vision's not strong and when people start, start to lose sight of the challenge we're trying to solve for or the goals that we have on that project, it starts to break down very quickly. And all of a sudden you have people that are, that are doing a lot of work, but they don't understand what they're working for anymore. So I think that that vision is key. Um, and more often than not, I find that there's breakdowns on the people side, less on the tool side, right? We know that with the right software, the right hardware and some training, we can create the, the BIM, right? And put some of those tools together. Um, but it's usually more of a people or process side. And so I think that's why like understanding that full VDC framework is so important. Um, because you really understand how all those different components come together. Um, because if even one of those starts to break down, you end up with implementation challenges. I think the, the value of learning from people on projects across the globe is that somebody is probably going through that same challenge or has gone through that challenge before. So you don't have to just learn from your own mistakes. You can learn from the mistakes of those that came before you um, and, and benefit from that. It's fantastic. Could, could you uh, maybe elaborate a, a little bit on, on sort of getting people on board? We've gotten quite a few questions about how do you engage with owners? I mean, I'm convinced that VDC is the way to go, but how do you engage with owners in convincing them to adopt VDC, um, especially if there's an initial higher cost in terms of time or resources? I can start. Um, mm -hmm. So I think... Uh, I think that a problem people typically face when talking to owners is that they very, very quickly get into the weeds. They get into the what, what are we going to do? Um, and I think when talking to owners and when starting to think about how do you align VDC with those overall organization objectives and the big picture on the project, like you need to start wider than that. You need to start with, hey, what's the vision? What's the values? Um, and maybe never actually talk about how the models are created or what sort of like PPM workflows are going to be used at the beginning, right? They need to understand the overall value proposition. Um, and then I think when it comes to cost, because I, I saw that that was specifically mentioned in one of the questions, there's a big difference between upfront cost and total project cost. Um, and so, yes, you might spend more um, cost right now in the planning phase. Um, but guaranteed, that saves you money. Um, in the examples I showed, right, it saves you money in, in general conditions. It saves you money um, in, in rework costs. And so I think there needs to be a reframing of, of what that cost means. Um, and that all comes down to metrics. So if we can't measure it, we can't, we don't know if it's working or not. And we don't know how to make changes. So the metrics part of, of the VDC framework, I think, is is um, essential here. 
Yeah, so picking up on that, uh, one way in which I've seen a project team successfully nudge everybody else uh, to, to go along and see the value of VDC is by establishing a shared metric that mattered to both. For example, on one project, a large infrastructure project on the East Coast, the project manager for the consultant, um, together with the client, they sat down and they said, you know, what What has messed up your project in the past? And so they shared sort of uh, over coffee uh, challenges that they had faced. And uh, they realized that one common challenge they had was answers to questions from the engineering team by the client. And so then they, they agreed on how long that duration should be. Now they had a metric they could track and they could then um, use to adjust the workflows, adjust the use of tools, adjust the use of timing of bringing people in, et cetera. And so that, that created sort of the initial yardstick that mattered to both that allowed them to then um, innovate um, in the context of that project. Um, other project teams have, have created um, this alignment between the project team and the owner uh, by really understanding what the client really wants from the facility. And uh, some clients, for some reason, are not that open to that, but others actually are once you start asking questions. And, and that has become then, that allowed them to focus not only on the cost, but also on the value of the facility. And that became very important in terms of uh, the focus of the BIM, the people involved in decision-making, et cetera. And, and this again started to get the, the VDC framework going on the project. Uh, so it's, it's really through early conversations, either sort of um, creating a bigger picture vision for the project, as Anil also alluded to, or by probably both uh, and would be ideal, and uh, creating a specific metric that you can track frequently that allows you to then uh, show, uh, bring BDC in. Um, so those are a couple of successful approaches I've seen. Fantastic. Uh, maybe just that we've also gotten a few questions on sort of the spread and the future of VDC. And so the first one is, do you, are there, is it spreading to different types? Have you seen implementations of heavy civil construction, such as dams or tunnels? Uh, similarly, we had a question whether you've seen VDC being brought into uh, manufacturing industries, whether it might be useful in developing cars or complex um, manufacturing like uh, airplanes. So we've definitely seen it uh, across small, big projects, across infrastructure, industrial, uh, institutional, complex buildings, um, housing, multifamily, residential. So we've seen it applied in uh, in many settings, um, uh, because right, uh, if you think about it, uh, why would a project be worse if you defined its goals? If you uh, used collaboration, if you used a good process, if you used uh, you know good tools, uh, so so that it really we have seen can uh, help you in, in in all types of projects. Um, the interesting question about the uh, the application to other sectors. Actually, I usually turn it around because. Um, um, you have seen many. You have probably seen the curve of you know declining or stagnant construction productivity, and uh, the increase in productivity in manufacturing and other industries. Um, sometimes we show that we didn't show it today because we figured that has been shown many times. Produced by my colleague uh, many years back here at SAIFI, uh, Paul Teicholz, initially. Um, and so then I was reflecting on why do we see this difference. Um, and also, I was reflecting because people ask me, Martin, why are you so convinced that VDC is the right way to do it? So basically, right, uh, manufacturing has increased the value add compared to construction by a factor of two and a half over the last 50 years, at least in the US. That's, you know, in a way bad, in a way a great opportunity for us. But if you reflect what is different 50 years ago in manufacturing and construction and now, 50 years ago in manufacturing, you didn't see well-defined metrics, objectives. You didn't have lean management processes. You didn't have attention to process. You didn't have digital uh, tools. You know, uh, you didn't have design for manufacturing. You didn't have integration of the organization. Today, it would be totally unthinkable that a world-leading manufacturing company does so without having a full digital model of what it's building without bringing design and manufacturing together, without uh, thinking about the user, um, and without establishing clear objectives, without measuring uh, 
uh, adjusting the workflow, uh, understanding it well, adjusting it continuously. So you see exactly the VDC elements represented in and uh, in the difference um, in added value per work hour that has been achieved over the last 50 years of manufacturing. And that I think we can get to, I'm convinced, um, by deploying VDC. Um, well, thank you, Martin and Danielle, for your, for your time. That was wonderful. And so uh, a nice way to sort of end VDC in many ways to implement some of uh, efficiency gains that we've seen in sectors and, and to speed it up and deeper, more efficient, smarter, as we said in the title. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you everyone who joined us today. A recording of the webinar will be made available in about a week. Um, and we appreciate your participation. I'm sorry, all the questions, uh, but I'll be sending them to, to Danielle and Martin so they can take what everyone was about. Thank you again.